Misty's running late, and if it's okay with the board, Claudine gets in us here. She's our insurance agent, and we would like to talk a little bit about the health insurance, uh, some ACA mandates that's coming up, if that's pleasing with the board. Hey, um, I've been talking with Kim. We've been back and forth on what county policy is saying, what the Affordable Care Act is mandating. And um, we all went to a place a couple of weeks ago. And the biggest thing, you know, that I think that uh, Graham County needs to do to get in compliance with the ACA mandates is um, looking at your part-time employees and um, this uh, Affordable Care Act has a lot of complicated formulas. But in a nutshell, if you have an employee that works what they call an equivalent full-time position, even though you may have them determined to be part-time, they work 20 hours this week, 15 hours the next week, 35 hours, and I think the jail will be a typical up and down cycle of part-timers going over and under that 30-hour mandate, you have to put them on health insurance. If you fail to do that and they make a, and they meet the full-time equivalent of 30 hours or more with a minimum of a 90-day, 90-day look back, yes. Um, if you miss, mess up on one, your penalty is $2,000 per employee times the number of employees that you have less 30 for one boo-boo. And -boo. Um, real easy to do. And if you, for example, if you've got 200 employees and you mess up with one of the employees and they meet that 30-hour threshold, your penalty is $2,000 times 200 employees, which is $400,000. They give you a credit out of the goodness of their heart of 2,000 times 30 employees, which is 60,000 deduction off of that. So one mess up could cost the county $240,000 penalty. So we have 200, we have 220. I'm just giving it high. That was easy for me to see my brain. I'm just, I just use that as an example to let you know how stiff that is. Yeah. It was easy for me. It didn't make All I can <laughs> <laughs> but it's a serious thing and so you know your department heads have to understand how, how destructive that this could be for Graham County that supervises part-time employees. The board needs to know how destructive it could be and you know if they don't stay on top of it and I know that you know we've talked about it but I think it's really important that uh, you know all department heads really meet, talk about this, understand, you know, what an issue that this is. And um, I think that your personnel policy probably will need to be revised a little bit. I know Kim's been working on that um, to get in tune with that. But in the meantime, while y'all are deciding to do that, I think that um, y'all need to um, Make sure decide. Happen. Yes, yes. Yeah. Make sure it doesn't. Happen. And it's, I mean, you're talking of, it'll allow you to go back 90 days to do a look back to determine, but this goes into effect January the 1st. So I think any potential employees that are going to start teetering up and down with that, and you, you will have some that you really can't control depending on, you know, what department that it's in. I think it would be cost effective for you to consider the possibility of just going ahead and putting those on the health insurance because the cost to put them on is not going to be anything compared to messing up on one. And it is, you mess up on one employee. And um, I mean, it's a very, very, very stiff penalty if you mess up. So. On our end, I, I've got it, you know, I, I did it two, two different ways. I did it per year, I did it nine days. It's coming up pretty much the same one year versus the 90 days. So we're determining the full-time equivalency yeah. is what it's called. It, it, it's not It's not drastic. Uh, the changeover that we've had uh, in the one department helps some. Um, you know, you have your um, cemetery crew that's going on. 
uh, you have your uh, some departments, the jail, you have that's going on. You can't determine transport, unfortunately. That that is just you cannot determine that. Um, there's some departments you cannot determine, and and I will give you a list when I'm talking about the personnel policy. I need to get with my department heads, and we need to really be strong before I bring you that policy in here. The cemetery um, workers, we can hire additional part-time workers if that's something we need to do to eliminate it there. Part of that problem um, for them is they'll give you seasonal employees, but these employees at the cemetery go beyond the seasonal time frame to where you can't even get out from under that loophole there. And I mean, if these mandates are, and what they'll give you on um, seasonal, temporary and things, I mean, they're very strict and most of them are designed to force you to put them on, but there are a little bit of wiggle room in there. Like, and I can go in that a little we bit have, farther. We have some here workers that are That's on, on hard waivers, but you got, you got to be a little cautious on, on, the, on the exchange because and the feds come in, see your people who qualify for our insurance that is on the exchange. If I don't offer that and they don't sign a waiver, I have to have a waiver signed, which I've been covering the bases pretty good, but I just have to really cross the T's and dot the I's there strongly or we get trouble on that end too. So there's lots of little loopholes in the ACA that's that's really complex when you start getting in it. But we're trying really, really hard uh, on the ACA where the exchange is concerned. I and mean, what that means, they're going to the facility to get health insurance yeah. instead of through the county. And then that automatically, it's not an audit, but it's the same as triggers it when they say they work for Graham County. So then we have to explain why they went to them and not here to avoid. And then they're going to check and see if they're justified in penalizing us or if it was a credible thing for them to be allowed to go on. Yeah. If they say, why didn't you take the free county insurance that you were eligible for instead of coming out to the exchange? Yeah. And, and what we can take the insurance here, go back out to exchange on the months that he's not working. So we, it gets a little bit confusing for the employee, for us. Yeah, it's, it, it's really complex. I mean, where well, you go into temporary, you get into seasonal, you get into part time, you get into part time, full time equivalency. I mean, it's. They've got it covered just about every which way you go. How many employees are on this uh, that, That's it that we're talking about yeah. right now? And I think on that uh, temporary uh, seasonal employees, um, we determined that the cemetery workers are actually working longer and don't actually qualify for that category where you can exclude offering under that because they went outside that threshold of their time frame and we couldn't classify them. How many months is it? Nine months? Nine months. Yeah, I think that, that was six months ish. I'm looking at 10 on this list, which I've got to go back. So we're looking at 10 people. 10 people. Yeah. I went ahead in the budget for 14, 15. Uh, and I kind of did a look back when I was doing the budget so I could see who were on the bubble. And most of it was falling like in the jail and in the cemetery. And I went ahead and tried to increase the budget line items to account for that, knowing that January 1 we may have to put some folks on um, just to be safe. So we're not talking. What's the bring in ballpark on that year for 10 no, no. no. The problem is, is at first everybody well, thought, oh, well, well it's not covering you know, and then they said, well, you've you you messed up on one and you've got the penalty. Well, we don't have any control over the chair. Right, it's forced, the, no. 
the health insurance, I think, that we pay for the employees is like $474 a month. Um, so that'd be 10 You had 10 about $50,000, $56,000 And the seasonal is 120 day work period, and if they go beyond that, which they do, um, there's no exclusion. No, not for theirs that they're working. They're, they're going under that full time, part time equivalency. Mm -hmm. is, you know, they work nine months. What if they don't want it? If they want it, they sign a waiver. They sign a waiver if they don't want it. But then if they go out on the exchange, they're not allowed, if, if they were to qualify for subsidy, mm -hmm. that's disallowed. They cannot, cannot get a subsidy for They would need to understand that. that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, way. that's where the lawyer comes in. She'll have to uh, fix me up something that states they are aware that they cannot receive a subsidy if they turn down this insurance. That's where Donna's going to have to come in. But, yeah, because we pay 100% of it, and therefore we've met the guidelines of affordability yeah. for them. So if they go under the exchange after we've made it affordable for them, then, you know, they're, they're not eligible for that subsidy, but if they take it, you know, it's it's not going to be off the backs of the county. Yeah. But, again, even, at the, even with those waivers, <coughs> excuse me, I don't think of, there will be that many that will not want it, if any. But you still have to be careful. You have to offer it to um, make it available to, um, I believe it's many numbers, it's either 95 or 99 percent of the employees. And even if we stay at the 95, we still should be able to if they want it and didn't want it. But you really have to be careful there because, you know, you may get through one way and then something on catch another up. one catch up with you because um, you still have to have that percent. And, and then when I start on the personnel policy change, I, I want to be very careful in the wording and put in every single thing of the ACA. I don't want to leave out one wording and that's why I haven't came to you uh, to change it because I want to be sure that I have everything from the school of government, from the IRS, and everything else in our personnel policy when, when it deals with the health insurance um, on this. I want the exact wording to be put in there when we go to make that change regarding uh, this, this subject of offering the health insurance to anybody that goes over the 30 hours, you know, that's considered eligible, not, I'm not gonna say over 30, eligible to receive health insurance. And that's at 30 hours. At 30 so hours. It's yeah. at 30 hours and above yeah. equivalency <coughs> average. So um, that's why, you know, somebody can work 20 hours, 15, and then 40, but that average, if it's 30 hours or above, they have to be offered it. And you have to do it within a, a correct time frame. It, I mean, it's immediate. It's not, uh, they give you that look back period, that stabilizing period, and the minimum's 90 days. But Kim said she went back a year to see, you know, which way was cost effective for the county. But the further back that you go for that look back, when you put an employee on, effective let's say January the 1st and she had a six month look back instead of the 90 days when you put them on you have to leave them on for the same length of yes. time going forward as you had that look back and kept them front so you don't want to put yourself out there too far and so the minimum on that's a 90 day look back so Kim and I talked on that and she's going to do the 60 or 90 days on it so that when you put them on you only have to, and if you just like hired somebody late, you know, for um, the cemetery and then put them on and the cemetery's over with, well, you can't just drop their insurance and say go undercover now. have to leave them on there for the same equivalent time, which would be 90 days minimum to have them covered. So you don't want your look back to go back so far 
that going forward you're going to have to carry them a longer period of time than you normally would if you to save the money. Well, I, I was curious to see how the numbers would fall right. at, versus the three months as far as their average hours. That was my curiosity. Right. I'm curious. So I, I was curious to see how their numbers would fall. And they're falling the same period. So that tells me they are eligible because the way their number of hours was falling. So that put them in. The 30 that put them in the bracket so there's no way you could pull them out and say they was not eligible for insurance that was my curiosity not that they were uh, not eligible but I, I was curious to see how their hours were falling and and there's no way they're not going to fall inside uh, that bracket of offering them insurance but I was just curious mm -hmm. any any way that to check the hours and and it, and the curiosity was was it going to fall within the year's time versus the 90 days time and, and it fell the same within within hours of each other within three hours so yes it was falling there's no way that you can pull right. it away from it so it did line up regardless of whether whether it was a year out or 90 days out those same employees was falling in that same so the cycle same. Yes. And I was concerned with the way that that uh, law read um, going, you know, if you do the win, look back six months, you have to have them with the same months of credit uh, going forward. If they quit their job, you know, are we required to keep them on? Because, I mean, you know, when you read that, just to take it for what it is, you still have to keep them on six months, even though they're still not working. But I found a thing in there where it said as long as they're an employee. So, you know, if they quit before that period forward is up, then, you know, we're okay to terminate their coverage then if they quit their job or something. But, but I think for the temporary seasonal, you know, um, we'd be cost effective to keep them on that 90 day period because you're really going to be laying them off they're not quitting because they're work right now so i mean it can be cost of, i mean really expensive for y'all but something you need to be aware of but the main thing is to make you aware of what stiff penalties that it is if you don't comply and i strongly recommend you know that y'all have a um, department head meeting and make it mandatory with all of them i know kim has talked to several already, but uh, I think it's really important that everybody has question and answers to where they understand the seriousness of it and the, the penalty that be on the county if these department heads didn't stay in close watch with the timesheets and stuff. And I have one other quick question, Claudia. Okay. Are, are there any modifications we're going to need to make to meet the affordability clause for no, we were we were looking on that, and um, back in 2010, um, you know they, you know they've made changes to all of this, and so I was able to get a, a February 14 version, and um, we have to make the minimum essential coverage available to employees and their dependents, but they're very clear that a spouse is not considered a dependent for the purpose of this act, and. Um, then it says that you have to make that coverage affordable. And one thing that we were reading contradicted the other on um, whether it had to be affordable to the employee or affordable to the employee for their dependents. But uh, the updated version mentions employee only. But you do have to have the minimum essential coverage made available to the employee employee's dependents other than the spouse. And in a nutshell, you're required to offer dependent coverage, but you're not required to offer a health plan that covers a spouse. So um, that uh, affordability didn't seem to apply there for the dependent coverage like we were thinking last week. And um, it was only for the employee, the employee. And if you chose to make the employee pay a portion of their premium, you cannot charge them any more than the nine and a half percent of their household income and um, different ways of obtaining that. Um, Kim's got that list on what we could do there if you decided to do that, but no matter what, I mean, that's the maximum that you could ever charge an employee on their cost. But we do 100%, so that's not applicable there. We offer for the dependent coverage, so 
we've, we've got that covered and then we um, have, we exceed the minimum essential coverage requirements. So we should be good with all of that. It's just this part time that's critical right now and needs to be squared away by January the 1st. I should have that this week. I should have that list. This, this is not respected the government. It's respected the yeah, same as well. Yeah. Same, same oh, space. yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. respected the same way. Because mm -hmm. we had to take a review and make that one time. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a. It's um, it's complicated, and you know when they get to talking about all of this stuff, it, you know you have to really concentrate when you're reading the parts of the law because it kind of meshes itself together to make the minimum essential coverage there versus the affordability. And good lord, I mean it, <laughs> it gets to be a headache. But you really have to concentrate. It's confusing. It is because and they've got all kinds of different formulas for each thing that you have to look at so but anyway I and you got for Claudia I can I can go with with them to meet with them and answer any questions that they've got I don't care if they want me to but okay well you can just let me know do y'all have any more questions Okay. Thank you. Thank you. These Itself. 
the other funding would be rolled into the grant. Uh, so to my knowledge, the, the only funding that the county would be liable for is the grant writing itself and, and to prepare that grant. Um, that being said, uh, I'd like to introduce Philip Penny and Brent Boykin from Mission Critical. If we have any questions for them or for me, I can take those now. Uh, Brent Boykin, Brent Boykin, Brent Boykin, Brent Boykin, Brent Boykin, Brent Tell us about some of the projects you've had, um, some of the projects that's planning, and what you're able to do, and what you're trying to do with this. Okay, sure. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Philip Penny. I'm a, a business development in Mission Critical Partners. Our office is in State College, Pennsylvania. I have a local office in Raleigh, North Carolina. What brings me here today is um, we are doing a grant funded project in Haywood County, and we have a meeting there tomorrow. Uh, additionally, we have a grant funded project, uh, like uh, Misty said, in, in uh, Jackson and Swain County. So we um, have written a number of these grants. Um, there is absolutely nothing that can tell you that if you submit a grant that you're going to be 100% guaranteed that you'll get it. Uh, there is a little bit of an art to, to the, the grant writing process. Um, we, last year, there was $11.5 million awarded in grants by the nominal board, and we're, we're administering $10.5 million of those projects. So they awarded four projects, uh, and we're doing three of those, three out of the four projects. Uh, we have, the, the year before that, uh, we did Rockingham County, we did Burke County, we've done Henderson County. All these are grant-funded projects, uh, and then between Burke and Rockingham, that two of those were $7 million a piece, and Henderson was $4 million. This year, along with the Haywood County grant, we, uh, we did get a $7 million grant from Federe County for a three-county consolidation project. Uh, it's a little different here. You're not looking at a three-county consolidation project, but what you are looking at here uh, is to be able to share resources and to be able to support each other in, in sort of a regional backup, and that certainly makes uh, makes it attractive to the 901 board uh, as we move forward and try to provide grant dollars for the project. And I'll be glad to take any questions. Do you think it would be uh, more more likely to a tier one county or these other counties to to receive the grants? Tier one counties are absolutely in the target area for these grant funding. So. The board has a little say in it. The, the grant money is for the needy, not the greedy. So if you have a big fund balance and you're asking for money, chances are you're not going to get it. So it's for these smaller counties uh, that can't su support things like a building project. You just, you just don't have the resources for it. So Graham County is certainly in the target for um, what the grant money goes for. It's, it's uh, like I said, tier one counties uh, are very high on their list. What would be the cost? Um, I don't, you know, Misty and I just started talking uh, week, last week, week before last a little bit. Uh, we had an end of the year uh, company meeting in State College. I was tied up there for four days last week. Uh, we talked at the end of uh, week before last. So I've not been able to give her um, a, a a, a fair price, um, but I will give her that, you know, based on recommendations from this board. I know you're not going to approve a project without knowing what the cost is going to be. Uh, but if, if you're, if, you know, this board is interested in moving forward, then by all means, I will give uh, Misty a proposal with the number, with the dollar amount. And we, what, what we do is we. We come in and help with the grant process. Misty will do some of it. We'll help her organize it, prepare it, get it together, um, and then we submit it. And then we submit a budget. And within that, within that uh, grant, there's a technology budget, there's a construction budget, there's an architect budget, there's a consulting budget. So our fees are built in that project. So under the grant, consulting fees are charged there not. So 
your upfront money would be the dollars you pay for the, the technical assistance for the grant writing. County dollars. I was under one of the first things we need to do is uh, sign up a piece of property. You, I'm sorry. Set aside a piece of property. We have to do that before the grants are written. No, absolutely not. No, I mean you can just conceptual. You can say, you know, we have three sites that we're thinking about. We have uh, land that we could build a truck up facility on. But when we submit the grant, you don't have to have a piece of property that says this is where it's going to be. Matter of fact, when we did the Dare pro uh, property, um, we we put in the application that we would identify three sites that would be acceptable to the committee. So all that sort of uh, determined after you get your grant award. Okay. Any other questions? Anybody got anything else? We thank you very much. Thank you.
you knew that people probably haven't seen a whole lot of those chemicals been out of our budget, but it's it's phenomenal. I've counted the house and everything else that strains us. So I'd like to you know, have y'all consider this and uh, I said we'd give it when we had the department had meeting on I'm already a few steps ahead because I've done heard what Claudine has to say and uh, like I said that that'll help me considerably I think with four more full time positions to get a better handle on this to keep anything back from happening. So Thank you for your time. And, uh, thank you.
that we fix the roads when they get here together. We'll work together. And I believe that we can we can move this county forward pretty good. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm glad to have you.